Our gospel this day comes to us from the 17th chapter of the gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now again, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and there's all of these teachings that are going on. I mean, we just finished all of these teachings about the lost sheep and the lost coin, the prodigal son. There's all these teachings on uh, life and stewardship when you deal with the manager, whether he was a faithful manager or not, and then the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And here, he responds to a question of his disciples. Actually, a demand would be a better way to put it. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you rather not say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, later you may eat and drink? Do you thank the slave for doing what, you have, what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The gospel of our Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a fun one we're going to play with a little bit. Um, but in honor of this Blessing of the Animal Sunday, I discovered a few things. You know, as always, I keep learning about different things. A number of people, you know, there was a lot of people, especially during the pandemic that invested in having pets while you were home, they had pets and everything else like that. And some people realized that the cost of some animals was a bit high. And the recommendation now after two years of experience is if you need a pet, you're worried about money, get a bird. It's just a little cheaper. Some I've noticed like to dress their animals up, especially for Halloween and stuff like that. I tried that once with one of my cats. I put a flannel shirt on him. The amazing thing is I turned him into a platypus. Now, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about these um, animals, these fantastic animals you sometimes read about in stories and everything else like that. You, do you know that there's actually a, a society for the protection of the Cheshire cat? Yeah. It seems that it's a vanishing breed. If you don't get it, go watch Alice and Moon. Okay. And one that I discovered that was around, that's a, that's a story from around here that I found very interesting talking to some people that, you know, I, I always wondered, you know, kind of like when it got dark, how did people get around? You know, how, how did people get around? And I found out that cowboys would take a lantern and hang it from their saddle so they could see where they're going. It was the first example of satellite navigation. Have you found your way yet? <laughs> yes, we have found our way to the end of the bad jokes. But how do we look at a lesson like this and find some illumination in it, to be honest? I mean, especially since it invokes certain images that are complicated or difficult for us to understand. Well, let me make it a little more complicated first because that's what I do. Here's a biology lesson for you. Actually, something that you can take with you when the next time you go to fries in the produce section. What does cabbage, kohlrabi, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts all have in common? Why? They're all cousins. They have a, share, a shared common ancestor, which is wild mustard. The mustard seed that Jesus is talking about was actually a weed. A couple of weeks ago, Jesus tells this story about, you know, if you have a hundred sheep and one wanders off, off, of course, you go and you leave the 99 to go find that one sheep. And everybody in this audience was looking at him like, you're insane. 
you don't leave 99 sheep to find one because when you come back, you might have 50 left. And you definitely don't go and tell everyone about the fact that, look, I left all my 99 sheep and I found this one, you know. Look, I was stupid and I got away with it. Well, the people at the time, hearing Jesus talk about, you need to have faith like a mustard seed, their reaction would be very similar to the farmers in my first call when I didn't know any better and this lesson came up in the lectionary and I went to the local Big R, which is like tractor supply in that part of the Midwest. And I bought a bag of grass seed and I put it in here. And I went and I talked about it and I held about the fact about this, you know, the seed. And to a person, every farmer in the congregation came up to me after the service and said, Pastor, if you put that seed anywhere near my field, you will be under it. You introduce grass into a farm field, they will hurt you. So then one of them went and found me actual wheat seed. But at least you'll be less harmful. And Jesus is here using the image of a horrible, invasive weed to these people. This is what faith is like. Confused yet? Much less than you add on the end of it where it talks about, well, if we're only supposed to do what we ought. We're just, that's all we're supposed to do. We're slaves. There is an image that most of us don't like to deal with. Well, let's stop and think about it. Wild mustard is wild mustard. It does what it does. Why? That's what it does. You know, people thought kudzu was a great idea in many parts of the country. Not anymore. But let's face it, if you have a sunflower in a cornfield, the sunflower is technically a weed. A weed is nothing more than something growing where you don't want it to. And the question is, okay, so how did you plan or train your field, your plants to be where they are, what they're supposed to be doing, when you want them to, and how you want them to? How many of you like wild mustard? How many of you will eat broccoli or cauliflower or kale or kohlrabi or, yeah, Brussels sprouts or cabbage? They're all cousins. Over the years, farmers, long before we knew about DNA and anything else like that, encouraged certain characteristics to come out. For the kohlrabi, it was the roots. For the, for the cauliflower, it was the flower part of the wild mustard. For the cabbage, it was the leaf. And over the generations, we created these different strains of plants that were, shall we say, much more appreciated unless your doctor says you have to eat them. Today on the blessing of the animals, we have various furry friends with us and we remember various furry friends we might have had in our lives. And if you stop and think about it, the common house cat and the, co and the dog basically have common cousins. They have, they have, for all the cats, they have a wild cat somewhere in the background. For all the dogs, there's a wolf somewhere in the background. And so yes, just like cabbage and kohlrabi and cauliflower are cousins, so is the dachshund, the poodle, the chihuahua, and the great dane. Different characteristics were bred in over time for different reasons. You wanted your terriers to take care of your rats. Your dachshunds went into holes to chase things. Your German shepherds and your pit bulls were for protection. Your labradoodles were for whatever. Retrievers and other animals. We worked on certain characteristics and some of them, let's be honest, We've done such a good job emphasizing certain characteristics. It's not necessarily to the benefit of the animal. 
pugs have now been bred to the point where many of them have difficulty breathing. But we had certain characteristics that we trained in them, that we looked for in them. So is it any wonder when some of these dogs that for centuries, if not almost millennia, have been trained to be attack animals, when they snap, they bite something? They've only done what they ought. We also have had experiences of just how they were raised by their immediate family. Some of you have rescue dogs. And some of you have shared with me at times where, especially for some strange reason, the presence of a male or the voice of a male makes them skittish or react. And the, the normal response that I'm told is, that must mean that somewhere in their past, they were mistreated. They only did what they were trained. Now cats, I don't know what the heck we've done with cats. Honestly, I think cats, we haven't bred them for certain characteristics. I think they're working on us. Because again, remember cats were worshiped at one time and I don't think they ever forgot it. But we look to certain animals, we look to certain breeds, we look to certain things for certain outcomes. You know, if you're gonna go duck hunting, you want a retriever. For some people, you want a pointer. If you're going to go racing, you find a dachshund. Dalmatian, sorry, wrong breed. That would be kind of funny, though, to have dachshund races. I'm sure they have them. You know, it'd be like a corgi race. You know, <laughs> here we are in the 20th minute of the first lap of the corgi race, you know. They've made it 100 feet, you know. But we look to certain things out of certain experiences, out of certain trainings, out of certain expressions we've worked on. We look for that in our animals. We've done it to our plants. What about us? How are we being shaped and formed? What characteristics and expressions are we encouraging or discouraging? What traits and characteristics are we bringing negativity to, to, trust, to suppress? Which ones do we elevate and extol? How do we condition ourselves? How do we train ourselves? and train others. I find it interesting that in this time, in this gospel, it says the apostles ask, not the disciples. Disciple means students. Disciple is the root for discipline. Apostle means sent one. The apostle is supposed to go out and proclaim and encourage and develop Why is Jesus telling his apostles this story? Is it to remind us to be careful of what we do and who we are? How we treat one another? Because that's the seed we're going to tend. That's the characteristic we're going to encourage. That's the trait we're going to either build up or break down. How are we acting when we are sent out from here? And what are we doing in the world? And it starts with being a disciple first. paying attention to what we are and who we are. It's often been said you can tell a lot about a person by how they treat their animals, right? It's also been said that you can tell a lot about a person by how they treat a server at a restaurant or someone that is perceived to be at a different station of life or position. How do we discipline ourselves 
to build up the characteristics of generosity, reaching out, advocacy, compassion, and encouragement? How do we encourage ourselves and train ourselves to seek grace and to live grace? Because when we sent out from this place, that's what the world needs. It doesn't need someone else pushing and nagging and yanking and criticizing. This is a world that needs more reconciliation and healing, kindness, mercy, justice for all, love. And this is what Christ does to us, and for us, and with us. These are the characteristics that he seeks to inculcate in us. This is how people will know you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. So may you be attentive to the life you are, to the seed of faith that is growing within you. May you be careful how you nurture it and the seeds of faith in others around you. May you seek to grow in faith, hope, love, grow in grace. And may you encourage that in others as well. And remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen.